Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we're going to discuss about Phalaenopsis flower spikes. This is a sort of continuation to the video series in which we talked about the roles and functions of the roots, leaves and pseudobulbs, so if you miss those videos but would like to see them, everything is down below in the description. But I will not generalize to all orchids today, I will only talk about Phalaenopsis because they're just too popular and there's a lot to talk about actually. So in front of us today we have a whole bunch of Phalaenopsis orchids, it's not my entire collection, and as we can see, they all have flower spikes and this is because, well, tis their season. And so let's start with a few ideas about flower spikes, what they are and how to actually obtain them. Now, like all flowering plants, orchids can bloom as well and when it comes to Phalaenopsis orchids, their bloom display is arranged on a flower spike. We call it this way, but actually it is a stem that bears buds and flowers. Flower spikes emerge from the actual axis or the stem of the orchid, this is why we don't call this a stem, just to make the distinction between the stem or axis of the orchid, which is the middle part, and the actual stem of the flowers. So the axis creates this elongated flower spike which in the course of a few months will grow, will elongate and will start to produce buds and flowers. One of the most common questions that I get is how to distinguish a root from a flower spike because orchids can produce aerial roots and in the beginning it can be quite confusing. Well, I'll link it down below to a video that talks all about that and shows an example, so I will not insist on that, but if you're interested, check the description down below. Now, Phalaenopsis orchids are known to create beautiful, flashy and long flower spikes, but the thing is, these orchids we have in front of us are not natural species. They are man-made hybrids, we call them complex hybrids. So what we see now is a very complex orchid hybrid with quite the surprising genetic pool. So when it comes to reblooming Phalaenopsis orchids, well, that's pretty much the easiest orchid to rebloom because it was created by humans and selected to be very willing to flower to produce really long and nice flower displays and flower spikes and so on. So having Phalaenopsis orchids blooming is not a hard thing to do, but this is one of the few orchids that requires a little trick to make it rebloom and it has to do with temperature. I'll insist a little bit on this topic because there are quite a few theories and from my experience I have my own opinion and my own conclusion and deduction. So here are my thoughts on how to rebloom a Phalaenopsis orchid. Now, Phalaenopsis orchids are seasonal bloomers. Keep in mind they are complex hybrids and anomalies can always happen, but generalizing the complex hybrids, they have a season in which they bloom and usually the spikes start to form in autumn or winter and they bloom in late winter or spring. Now, there is a very good reason for that. Phalaenopsis orchids depend on external factors to start producing the flower spikes. Now, the most common theory you will hear is the drop in temperature. When temperatures get lower in comparison to summer, a Phalaenopsis is prompted to produce a flower spike. And I have to say, I agree. I would go as far as to say it is the main factor that induces a flower spike. And I'll tell you why I believe that. Now, some theories suggest that day length actually has to do something with it. Now, if you're not very acquainted to my channel, you might not know that I moved countries. In my older climate, which was a temperate climate, I lived in Romania, temperatures started to drop summer in September. I would transition from the hot summer to a moderate autumn summer in September. Now, the temperature drop that Phalaenopsis usually require is around 17 to 18 degrees Celsius and you'll have the Fahrenheit equivalent on the screen as well. Now, in the new climate I am in, which is a subtropical Mediterranean climate, this drop in temperature absolutely does not happen in September. It doesn't even happen in October. It happens somewhere in November, mid or late November. Now, in my old climate, my Phalaenopsis orchids started to produce flower spikes somewhere in September, while in my new climate, my Phalaenopsis started spiking somewhere in November. Now, if we were to believe that day length has a major impact in the production of flower spikes, these things will not add up. My current location and my old location are pretty similar when it comes to day length. There is a very, very slight difference, but not enough to draw a conclusion. In September, the day is a lot longer than in November. If day length would be such an important factor, then my Phalaenopsis should have been able to spike in September or early October in this climate as well. Another theory suggests that it's not necessarily the temperature itself, but the variation between day and night. And although this might help as well, again, I don't think it is such an important factor. 
In the summertime, usually I have 28 and in extremes 29 degrees in my greenhouse, while in the nighttime I have 25, 24 degrees. So if you calculate, I have about 4 or 5 degrees Celsius difference between day and night. For all intents and purposes, that's quite the variation. But none of my orchids actually spiked during the summertime, they grew vegetatively. When they started to spike, I did still have a variation, but the minimum actually went to about 17 degrees. So there is a chance that the variation in temperature actually can affect it or can induce an orchid into blooming, however, this variation needs to occur in certain temperature ranges. If you have a variation from 30 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius, your orchid most probably will not be prompted to bloom. However, if this variation happens between 17 degrees Celsius and 22 degrees Celsius, well, that's a whole different story. But this doesn't tell us if the variation is the one that caused the flower spike or the actual minimum temperature, which dropped considerably in comparison to summertime. So due to my experience, I cannot say if day length or temperature variation is the initial factor that prompts an orchid to spike. But I can definitely tell you from my experience that the spiking usually occurred when the lower temperatures, the night temperatures, reached about 17-18 degrees Celsius and in the daytime they did reach 23, maybe 24 degrees Celsius. In my opinion, to be able to re-bloom a Phalaenopsis orchid, it would be very helpful if you could provide 17 or 18 degrees Celsius during nighttime. Now, along the years, I had viewers from very warm climates telling me they cannot rebloom their Phalaenopsis orchids, while others, again in warm climates, told me they don't have any issues in reblooming Phalaenopsis orchids. In some countries, Phalaenopsis orchids are even rare in the stores, and this is because people cannot rebloom them so easy. My opinion is that there are differences even in between two very warm climates, and I do believe a difference of 1 degree Celsius can make the difference with some orchids. Kids. If you grow them in a home and you keep a constant temperature, maybe reblooming will not happen when you expect it, or it might not happen at all. But as I was saying, since we are dealing with man-made orchids, very complex hybrids, there are always exceptions. You can always have a Phalaenopsis bloom in the middle of summer, just because, as well as you can have a Phalaenopsis which doesn't want to bloom no matter what. But for the main part, these are easy orchids to rebloom, and I do believe that the main factor that influences the flower spike is the lower temperature, particularly in the nighttime. Now, how long does an actual flower spike take to bloom from the moment we see it? Well, this varies. Generalizing a bit, they take between two to three or even four months from the moment you first see the flower spike to the moment it is in bloom. There is, however, one thing that influences how fast the orchid spike grows, and this is temperature. In lower temperature, the whole metabolism of a plant is slowed down. This will translate in a slower growth of the flower spike as well. Also, quantity of light can influence this as well. If you don't provide enough light, the orchid might grow slower because it photosynthesizes less than it would in a bright light. As a general idea, Phalaenopsis orchids cannot tolerate full hot noon sun, but they do enjoy bright shade. Keeping them in very, very dark conditions is never a good idea, and it can influence the ability to bloom as well. Now, in very low temperatures, some orchids don't respond that well. Buds can fall, flowers can drop prematurely, as well as in very high temperatures, or hot drafts, or very cold drafts. So this is something you should keep in mind when your orchid is in spike, try to maintain it as stable as possible. You don't need to offer that temperature variation anymore, that is only useful for initiating the flower spike, but afterwards I think it is better to keep it in intermediate conditions for the development of the flower spike, the buds and the flowers. Usually Phalaenopsis orchids can create one flower spike, but they can also create two flower spikes. And in some cases, particularly with new purchases, they can even create three flower spikes at once, I don't have an example, or even four. Well, there are a few things at play here. First of all, there is the genetic information. The orchid needs to be able to produce so many flower spikes and so many blooms. Bloom count as well is affected by genetics. If the genetic information tells this orchid to create only four flowers, well, it will never create more than that. However, if genetics permit it to create a multitude of flowers, it will always try to create them, provided she has good conditions. And let's speak about these things because it's a pretty bushy subject. 
Now many people ask me if they will ever get such a nice bloom display and a high bloom count in their care. When we first purchase Phalaenopsis orchids, they can come with a multitude of blooms, very showy flower spikes, but the next year it will rebloom for us, it might not be as beautiful and as lush. Well, in my opinion, you can have the same display in your care as well, if not even better. Now, the quality of the flower spike and the flowers is in my opinion only related to one thing the capability and willingness of the orchid to invest energy into the flower spike and when i say energy i actually refer to sugars or the elaborated sap which results from photosynthesis now the factors that can influence this investment oh there are a lot of them so i will try to go through as many of them as possible just to illustrate how certain factors can influence ultimately the flowers now i believe the number one reason why an orchid does not produce as many flowers as it's capable of producing is stress and this is pretty logical if you have an orchid that suffered some sort of stress like root loss or maybe leaf loss or sunburn and so on well that orchid instantly does doesn't have as much energy as an orchid which is perfectly healthy. And this is easy to see why. The roots are responsible with absorption of water. If we have a lack of roots, the orchid might be slightly dehydrated. Therefore, the quantity of sap will be reduced because there is no raw material to process through photosynthesis. If we have an issue with the leaves, again, we have a stressed orchid and an impaired orchid. The leaf is responsible with photosynthesis. If we don't have enough leaves to photosynthesize, we will not have the same quantity of sap. Therefore, the energy allocated to the flower spike will be less as well. And that will show in the quantity and quality of the blooms. Also, if you have an orchid that suffered a pest infestation, that can stress it as well and can affect the quantity of sap. If we have an orchid that did not receive enough light, the sap quantity again will be diminished and it will not be available for the blooms and so on. Stress factors can come in so many different shapes that it's really hard to mention them all together. Pretty much whatever impairs your orchid or stops it from performing her functions in full capacity will reflect on the flower spikes as well. The second very common reason why an orchid might not produce a lot of flowers is the out of season issue. We can find Phalaenopsis orchids in the stores pretty much all year round. And this is because in commercial nurseries, they are manipulated into thinking it's autumn, let's say, when in fact it is spring outside or summertime. This is easily done by controlling the temperature. The light might be controlled as well, I am not sure, but definitely temperature control can initiate flower spikes pretty much whenever. In the winter time, when it will be prompted to start creating another spike, it might not have energy to create it. Therefore, it will not create it. Or if it starts to spike, it might be a very poor spike because the orchid did not have enough time to replenish all the energy spent in the previous flowers, the ones that the orchid came with. Usually the best displays are obtained on orchids which are properly seasoned, which went through a good period of growth, of growing leaves, of growing roots, and of properly accumulating nutrients in comparison to an orchid that didn't go through this good vegetative period. One of the reasons why an orchid might not bloom is simply because it doesn't have space to bloom. Each new flower spike will not emerge from the very same place of the older flower spike. It will always need a new room. So as you can see, flower spikes are created from between two leaves. Usually, if you look on a side, the flower spike is created beneath the second leaf. This orchid cannot create a flower spike from between these two leaves because the actual structure that is responsible with the creation of the flower spike is not mature yet, is not created. So if we have an orchid that didn't grow any leaves, there is a high chance we will not get flower spikes simply because there is no room to produce them. If an orchid created one leaf, it will have an available space. So maybe that orchid will create a flower spike. If we have an orchid that created two or three leaves, we will have two spaces available, so that orchid can actually produce two flower spikes. In rare occasions, it happens that flower spikes can be created further down the orchid. And I say rare because it really has to do with the genetics of the orchid. Another rare occasion is the terminal spike, which is a spike who emerges from the crown of the orchid, the middle. We call it a terminal spike because usually what happens is that the orchid cannot produce any more leaves, therefore it will not grow. What will happen next is that the orchid might create a keiki. And I have a video down below with an orchid who suffered from crown rot damage 
which is pretty much what that flower spike does. It damages the crown. In rare, rare, rare cases, we can still have a growing orchid if the spike didn't manage to fully destroy the crown. But now let's presume that we have a Phalaenopsis orchid, which is in full season. It was not out of season. It created leaves and roots during the vegetative growth in the summertime, but the spike is really not that showy. Also, the bloom count is not something to write home about either. What could possibly be wrong then? Well, and this is just my personal opinion, based on my experience, I believe it is a fertilizing and a feeding issue. In my opinion, Phalaenopsis orchids are extremely heavy feeders. And I have a joke about it, consider fertilizer being trash and the orchid pot being the trash bin dump the fertilizer in. I think it is pretty easy to see how fertilizer influences the orchid and it has to do with that sap. By fertilizing we are offering nutrients, part of them go into the process of photosynthesizing and other nutrients go into other processes that ultimately help photosynthesis. Therefore, if we have an impairment of nutrients, photosynthesis is slowed down, is impaired and pretty much anything that doesn't function at full capacity will not yield the full capacity of of results. Okay, now flower spikes on a Phalaenopsis orchid can be quite long-lived. Each flower can last for about three or four months in good condition and considering that the flower spike can branch out or can continue to grow from the top, you can even have this orchid in bloom for an entire year. And if you're wondering what to do when the flowers are all done, how you should cut the flower spike, if you should cut and so on, well check the description below. I have a full video only about this subject, what to expect when you cut it, what can happen, why do we cut it, it, should we cut it? So do check the description below, but let me just say that cutting the flower spike will not kill an orchid. It really doesn't have anything to do with the health of the orchid. Moreover, you're kind of helping it. The thing that I like to do is forcefully start vegetative growth on my Phalaenopsis. If one of my fells decides she wants to put out a branch with another two flowers and this happens at the beginning of summer, the flower spike is completely cut because I am more interested in offering vegetative growth and offering the time for the orchid to properly stock up on nutrients so I have a good display in the winter. But that is a personal preference. Another thing to keep in mind is that Phalaenopsis orchids, like many other orchids, have storage devices. And these are the leaves and the roots as well. So you can have that instance in which you have a Phalaenopsis orchid which you don't fertilize for six months or a year and it still blooms quite nicely. Well, the thing is that those nutrients that are stocked up will eventually deplete. Therefore, it is my personal choice to cut the flower spikes and give that period of activity for the orchid. Some people call it rest, call it whatever you want. It is actually an activity period. When new leaves start to grow, when the roots start to grow again, the orchid piles up on nutrients, performs photosynthesis, creates new spaces for flower spikes to develop and practically grows. And to answer another question that many of you ask, do I still fertilize when flowers are open? And the answer is yes. Phalaenopsis orchids are not dormant orchids. They don't have rests or dormant periods and so on. But because they usually start to spike in autumn and winter, the quantity of fertilizer that I offer is reduced. Has nothing to do with flowers necessarily, but all of my orchids receive less fertilizer simply because temperatures are lower, day length is shorter, the quantity of light overall might be smaller than in summertime. So pretty much everybody has a slow metabolism, so they don't require as much fertilizer. They don't even require as much water purely because of the external factors, not because Phalaenopsis have dormancies or things of the sort. So yeah, I pretty much always fertilize. I do tend to fertilize less than summertime. The flower spikes of a Phalaenopsis orchid tend to grow towards the light source. And I've placed my orchids on the shelf just so you see how they usually stand. The spike will not try to go to the shady part of your growing environment, but towards the light. The explanation for this doesn't necessarily have to do with photosynthesis in my opinion, it just has to do with where the pollinators can see the flowers better. If they grow towards the light, there is a higher chance that the pollinator will see the flower. If it's summer tucked in the darkness, maybe the pollinator will not even see it. So when your orchid starts to create a flower spike, it is a good idea not to move it around too much. If you change the location of the light source, you can have a pretty snake-like flower spike. But moreover, the buds can orient themselves to different light locations. When they form, they will try to face the light and after they bloom, they will not move around too much. So if some of the flowers are already open and you switch the location, some of the buds will orient in a different location. Therefore, you'll end up with a flower spike with flowers in all directions. 
Accidents happen sometimes as well, but for a nicer display it is a good idea not to move the orchid from its location too much, simply to get a better display. And I'm showing you this orchid because it did something pretty cool. The flower spike started to grow towards the light, it hit the leaf actually, and it managed to outgrow the leaf and now it's heading towards the light once again. And regarding this, I have a video in the description below that shows you how to create a nice pendant flower spike with all the flowers open on one side. So if you're interested in that, check the description. Now regarding staking flower spikes, well, this is your option. You can leave them be, you can stake them, you can do whatever you want, but keep in mind the flowers are very heavy. So if your pot is light, let's say you have a plastic pot with a light medium such as bark chips, the orchid might completely fall over, so you need to stabilize that pot. A good way is to use decorative containers made out of ceramic, which are heavy, in which you can place the plastic pot. My solution is a clay pot and clay medium, so my orchids are really not going anywhere, therefore I just didn't stake them. I much rather prefer the pendant flower spikes. And I think that's about it. Let's end it here because it's a long video already. So thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed this, and particularly if you are a beginner, hope this sheds some light. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe to my channel for daily orchid and plants videos, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. And with that said, I'll see you all next time. Bye! I'm really loving this Hoya right now. Check out her leaves. It's like a work of art, isn't it? And if you look at the colors and how they transition one into another, it's a sort of a water paint, is this how you call it? That's exactly what it reminds me of. This is such a beautiful Hoya. And by the way, it is called Hoya Australis. When the leaves start to emerge, they're kind of reddish, and then as they age, they lose the red and remain different shades of green. Isn't this gorgeous?